Good morning. Thank you, Aaron. Uh, doing historical research in these peculiar times has its challenges. So for their help with this talk, I want to thank Javier Marufo of the Silver City Public Library, Ashley Smith of the Silver City Museum, Susan Berry, and the County Clerk's Office, which has old newspapers in uh, bound form. It's a boon for a researcher, but it, it's somewhat limited these days, as you can imagine, access to it. So let's go to the slides, please. In 1918, Silver City, not yet 50 years old, was growing from a small frontier town into an aspiring up-to-date bigger town. This is a photograph of Silver City in the late 19 teens, the time of the, of the influenza epidemic. This is taken from the corner of Bullard and Broadway, looking north on Bullard. And you can recognize that building in the center of the picture here with the three large columns. It was a bank back then. More recently, it's been the municipal court. But you can see all the automobiles in the late 19 teens. Uh, the, the town is up to date. They'd recently acquired modern amenities in the neighborhoods and uh, it was looking up and the booms, uh, the, the mines were booming during the war in general, most of them, because of wartime demands for materials. In September 1918, people here were preoccupied with three overriding issues. The Great War, as it was called in Europe, how our local boys were faring over there. There was a fair number of local boys who would, were overseas in the armed forces. And that was a matter of great concern, of course. And the off-year elections coming up in November. That's what people were thinking about <clears throat> in September of 1918. The next picture. This is the new ladies' hospital, as it was called. It, uh, it wasn't really a hospital for women. It was a hospital run for women, uh, particularly for indigent people, people who couldn't afford the other hospital in town. Erin, um, are you having trouble with that ladies hospital? The next slide. Well, I'll just keep talking. The ladies hospital, um, there I am. Yeah. I'm sorry, everybody, Is this, was the slide not showing? It wasn't showing, no, we were still back on Bullard Street. Uh, so we're oh. looking for we're looking for okay. the next slide, the ladies' hospital. Okay, let me try that again. Hold on. Sorry about that. It's okay. There it is. As I was saying, the ladies' hospital was not a hospital for women, but a hospital run by women as a charity. It was for people who couldn't afford the regular hospital here. And they'd been in much smaller quarters out on Hudson Street near the red light district in town. And this was a, a great improvement. Um, the new building, this building you see there now, was formerly a convent run by the Sisters of St. Joseph up the top of Cooper and uh, Kelly Streets. Uh, renovations to the hospital were being rushed forward that fall in case the Spanish flu reached Silver City. Nobody knew what was going to happen at that point. The flu crept up on us here slowly and later than in most of the country. The Spanish flu epidemic of 1918 to 1920 was not really Spanish. It had nothing to do with Spain. Nobody knows for sure where it started and all of its statistics are just rough guesses, that's all. Worldwide, it killed maybe 50 million people, 50 million people. Uh, in the US, it was maybe 500,000 to 850,000 deaths from the flu. Now, if that proportion of the US population in 1918 were killed today, that would mean from 1.6 million to 2.7 million dead Americans. So given the advantage of a century of medical progress since 1918, COVID-19 has been much less lethal at least so far, but of course, we're still in the midst of it and things are still getting worse. So who knows? Next photo, please. The invasions by the Spanish flu coincided with the final year of World War I. That was a time of massive troop movements. Within warring nations and across the oceans, 
These movements, typically in crowded, unsanitary conditions, spread the flu around the world. The virus was especially lethal for young people between the ages of 20 and 40. It seemed upside down. The strongest and healthiest among us were the most likely to die. In the US, the flu first appeared in military camps because that's what's spreading it. And this was still years before anti antibiotics and antiviral drugs. So the medical practices of 1918 could do very little to stop it really. After a relatively mild flare up in the US during the first half of 1918, a much deadlier second wave began in September. It started in Eastern seaboard cities, Boston, New York, Philadelphia, where troop ships were arriving from and departing to Europe. In this second wave, the victims often died of bacterial pneumonia after being weakened by the flu. The US Surgeon General in September issued rules that will sound familiar to us now. Avoid crowds, smother coughs, breathe through the nose, open windows, be clean, wash hands before eating, and so on. But nothing as yet about masks. The next photo, please. The flu reached the Southwest in October. On the third of that month, El Paso reported 250 cases, mostly from Fort Bliss nearby, a military camp. Three weeks later, nearly 5,000 cases and at least 400 deaths. Mortality was especially high among the Mexicans on the south side of El Paso. On October 5th, Albuquerque counted eight cases and two deaths. Two weeks later, those numbers had climbed to 489 cases and 69 deaths. It could happen just like that. Overnight, the situation changed. Now, Silver City, then as now, is protected by its relative isolation and was in, alerted by these encroaching dangers. So we knew it was coming. We just didn't know if it was gonna come here, but we had to prepare. So Silver City, this is quite striking to me. They took steps here even before the flu had reached Grant County. On October 1st, for example, the New Mexico Normal School, the ancestor of Western New Mexico University closed for the duration and sent its students home. The next photograph, please. The flu arrived here in mining camps, in the mining towns of Santa Rita and Tyrone and at Fort Baird. This photograph here is the hospital at Fort Baird. It had earlier been established essentially as a hospital for tuberculosis patients because we'd become a tuberculosis uh, a haven for people fighting tuberculosis. In the war, it had to switch over to being a hospital for people with the flu. And it's always mixed together there. On October 10th, still with no cases in Grant County, in Silver City, I mean, no cases in Silver City, Mayor Percy Wilson and County Physician C.S. Guthrie closed the public schools and banned, quote, gatherings at places of amusement, unquote, like bars, restaurants, theaters, dance halls. After nine flu deaths at, Saint, at Fort Bayard in the first two weeks of the month, October, the hospital there imposed a partial quarantine, holding meetings outside, restricting visitors, and granting fewer passes to Silver City. Now, this early disciplined response probably limited the initial impact of the virus here. Quote, Silver City has so far practically escaped the influenza epidemic, a local newspaper said, at the end of October, thanks to the timely precautions which have been taken. But here we encounter a gaping blank spot in the historical record. The two weekly newspapers in Silver City the Enterprise and the Independent were edited by and for Anglos. They seldom extended much coverage except for crime stories of local Hispanics. So Hispanic births and deaths generally went unreported in these two newspapers. 
The next photo, please. Hispanic residents of Silver City were clustered on Chihuahua Hill, south of Broadway. It's reasonable to infer that they, like the Mexicans on the south side of El Paso, suffered inordinately from the flu. Here we have a photograph of a class at the Lincoln Elementary School, the first segregated public school in Silver City, which had just been opened in 1915. This photo is sometime from the 1920s, it's a few years later, but you get the point. It's a segregated public school, the first one in Silver City. In recent years, the Anglo neighborhoods of Silver City had gained electricity service and indoor plumbing. Those modern amenities with their sanitary and health advantages had not yet reached Chihuahua Hill. It was just in the Anglo neighborhoods to this point. On Chihuahua Hill, their large families in small houses were more vulnerable to spreading the epidemic. Many could not afford doctors or hospitals. And in any case, they perhaps did not trust Anglo medical personnel to treat them fairly. So you have to bear that in mind during what I'm going to be saying. That is that there is hardly anything in the newspapers about what is happening on Chihuahua Hill about this. They're only talking about white Santa Rita. That's all the sources we've got in those two Anglo newspapers. The next photo, please. Grant County's first serious brush with the flu came after an outbreak among miners in the gold and silver mining camp of Mogollon, 70 miles to the Northwest in Socorro County. This photo is of Mogollon as a ghost town, which it has been for some time now. Mogollon was then a wide open place with a history of catastrophic floods and fires. Regular shipments of gold and silver, that's what they mined there, went to Silver City, 14 hours away by horse-drawn stage and eight hours by the newfangled automobiles. Almost overnight in October, the camp clocked 200 cases and 20 deaths. Mining operations shut down. The two physicians in Mogollon were overwhelmed. They sent a desperate appeal to Silver City, the nearest town of any size, the nearest town with railroad service. In response, this is quite striking, the Grant County Red Cross, chaired by Annette Kinyon, K-I-N-Y-O-N. Her husband worked at the Santa Rita Mine and she was a prominent club woman in Silver City and a woman suffragist. Under Annette Kenyon's leadership, the Grant County Red Cross mobilized at once by sending local women to Mogollon. Seven school te teachers and nurses from the White Cross Hospital and the Cottage Sanatorium left at once for Mogollon. 11 more women came from Tyrone and six from Santa Rita, 24 women in all, just picked up and went to Mogollon. Other women here at home set to work sewing masks and pneumonia jackets. Pneumonia jackets were to keep people warm when they had pneumonia because it was very hard to keep them warm. Now, the place they were headed to, Mogollon then consisted essentially of three ethnic groups. Mexicans, recent Italian immigrants, miners, and Anglos. The town had two churches, Presbyterian for the Anglos and Catholic for everybody else. At the other extreme of respectability, Mogollon also had two brothels, one for Mexicans at the east end of town and Little Italy, as it was called, at the west end, where 18 women plied their trade, obviously a good business in a mining camp. It's worth noting, I think this is important, Given the hardening class and ethnic lines in Grant County in these years, the increased segregation and discrimination against Hispanics that was beginning to be more visible here, that the merciful women rushing to Mogollon were middle-class Anglos endangering themselves to care for working-class Hispanics and Italians. We should all appreciate that because it runs so counter to the main tendencies of this time. Um, we had just gotten the first two fully segregated towns in Grant County, 
Santa Rita and Hurley. Uh, we had just, as I said, we'd just gotten the first segregated public school in Silver City. The tendencies were entirely in the other direction toward discrimination and mistreatment. And yet here these 24 women heroically went to Mogollon to do what they could. So the Red Cross's influenza pamphlet was translated into Spanish. Fort Bayard, Santa Rita, and Hurley all sent supplies. The flu in Mogollon was soon deemed under control. Quote, heroic work was done, the Independent reported, and many lives saved, unquote. But many lives were also lost. Of about 1,500 residents there, more than 50, there's no exact figure, but no more than 50 died in this flu outbreak. The cemetery ground was frozen solid. So corpses were laid on benches in the old dance hall awaiting burial. The women returned to Grant County and the risks they had run soon became apparent. Silver City recorded its first cases of the flu. By November 5, there were 31 cases, still no deaths. A few days later, the first three deaths. It was the coldest fall and winter in anybody's memory, forcing people indoors and incubating the virus. The next photo, please. A mandate to wear masks, not previously enforced, became common. The Hurley Red Cross sent 300 masks to Fort Bayard. The Fort Bayard Red Cross, not to be outdone, produced 1,800 masks in a few days. The wards at the Fort Bayard Hospital required masks now. Nurses even wore them to bed at night. In Silver City, store clerks and others working in public places put on masks. The town enforced a quarantine. Hurley banned all gatherings and closed its schools. Five women teachers who had been working as nurses came down with the flu. In Santa Rita, the fancy new segregated clubhouse for Anglo employees, almost completed, became a hospital ward. The Silver City newspapers now routinely carried reports of flu deaths, almost entirely of young people, almost entirely Anglos. Katie Tillman, 20 years old, leaving her husband and a baby, three months old. Ernest E. Smith, 34, a chemist for the Empire Zinc Company at the Cleveland Mine. Lydia Donahue, 31, the wife of a rancher on the road to Pinos Altos, leaving seven children, the youngest seven months old. Daniel Rodriguez, 16, a grocery clerk. Lula A. Woods, age not given, a matron at the ladies' hospital, leaving her husband and son. She had been nursing her neighbors and so had no medicine left for herself when she became ill. In late November, local optimists thought they saw some encouraging signs. The virus seemed to be practically eradicated at Fort Bayard. Hurley citizens looked forward to attending dances and moving picture shows. The Santa Rita clubhouse was no longer needed as a hospital ward. Silver City lifted its ban on public gatherings. But then a turn. In mid-December, there was a large and surprising turn for the worse in Santa Rita, particularly in Santa Rita. So why this late reversal of recent trends? I would emphasize here, this is just a guess. There's no proof, but this is what I think happened. The next photograph. This is John M. Sully, S-U-L-L-Y. He was the general manager of the town and open pit mine in Santa Rita and of the town and converter mill in Hurley. As the absolute boss of those workplaces and towns, John Sully was the most powerful man in Grant County, more powerful than any mere politician. His wife and children were prominent citizens of Santa Rita. They were the biggest, he's the biggest guy in Santa Rita. His daughter, Ruth Sully, was attending the Marlboro School in Los Angeles 
that was a posh, still is a posh secondary school for girls. And she was there with her friend, Helen Carrier, the daughter of a doctor at the Santa Rita Hospital. In November, their school in Los Angeles was closed because of a flu outbreak. The girls, apparently carrying the virus, took the long tra train ride home to Santa Rita. Uh, it dropped them in Deming and then they got picked up there and brought by automobile to Santa Rita. Helen developed a mild case of the flu. It's not clear whether she showed symptoms after arriving here or was already showing symptoms on the train ride. It's not clear. In any case, it was soon the Christmas season with many parties and hometown friends they had not seen for three months. One may imagine that like many young people who are now flouting the rules of our current pandemic, that they were heedless of health dangers and thought they were invulnerable. That's a common fallacy among the young. Ruth and Helen returned to Los Angeles after about two weeks at home. Within a few days, 30 new cases of the flu had descended on Santa Rita. They were caused, according to the Enterprise's local correspondent from Santa Rita, by too much careless visiting among households. The worst months are still ahead of us, the correspondent predicted, and people needed to obey health officials. The next photo, please. This is Mexican town in 1916, just two years before the flu. Uh, it's a great panoramic view, and this is just part of it. You can see the homes are very simple. A lot of them are shacks built by the miners and their families. The, uh, there were no rental houses in Mexican town that were owned by the town. Uh, but the, the mining company would rent a lot to a Mexican, Mexican family, and they would then build their own house on that lot. So it's somewhat um, informal, shall we say. Uh, on the right, in the middle distance, that long, low building is a bunkhouse for unmarried men. Most of the miners, Mexican miners, had their families with them. And they built a house for them. Um, there was a separate segregated school for them in Santa Rita. That's the bunkhouse for men who did not have families. On the hill at the back, perhaps you can make it out, is the Catholic Church, a major force in this community, of course. And all those little black boxes are outhouses. There were no modern conveniences, no electricity, no natural gas, no running water, no sewer in Mexican town. And now in these conditions, unsanitary conditions because of the lack of running water and indoor plumbing, the flu has now descended on Santa Rita and probably in particular on Mexican town. The Santa Rita hospital was now overcrowded with flu patients. When a pregnant woman, Margaret Sheridan Fay, about to give birth, was admitted on the morning of December 6th, she was told that if she had come five minutes later, they would have had no place for her. Margaret was put in an unheated room about to give birth. Most of the nurses were volunteer school teachers, willing but untrained in basic nursing procedures. With all the rooms now taken at the hospital, flu victims were dying in the hallways. Margaret delivered a healthy baby girl. Two weeks later, her husband, Charles Fay, died of pneumonia and the flu. He was 29, the assistant superintendent of the Empire Zinc Mine in Hanover. They'd been married for almost two years. The death watch in Grant County continued. James Clancy, 29, employed in the office of the Cottage Sanatorium, known for a ready wit and sunny disposition. L.A. Fitzpatrick, 35, owner of the Ritz Jewel Shop in Silver City, after apparently recovering from the flu, he left his widow. Lillian Parsons, 11 years old, of Santa Rita 
after being sick for a week. She was attended at the hospital by Dr. F.N. Carrier, the father of Helen Carrier, who perhaps helped bring the flu to Santa Rita. This is Henry Stewart, her first name and her age not given, wife of a letter carrier. She'd been nursing her three sick children at home and caught the flu from them. Harry Bridges, 27, a deputy in the county assessor's office, married for about a year to Sylvia Johnson, a school teacher. The next photo, please. This is Santa Rita as a ghost town later on. The late outbreak in Santa Rita abated by mid-January. On January 19th, it's two churches, the Catholic Church in Mexican, Mexican town, which we just saw, and the Protestant Santa Rita Union Church on the Anglo side of town. Those two churches held their first services in over three and a half months since early October. A week later, both halves of the town could attend the first picture show since the flu had descended. Still, the flu would not fully subside. In February, it broke out again in Fierro, Hanover, and the upper Gila River with many cases and several deaths. In March, a final spasm in Silver City kept many kids home from the recently reopened schools. Back to me, please, Aaron. And then at last it ended later that spring. The final reckoning of cases and deaths in Grant County is unknowable because New Mexico had no State Department of Health, no central agency to track and respond to the academics course across the, the state. Making a reasonable guess about the toll in Grant County is not a simple process. The Silver City newspapers, those two weeklies, recorded about 31 flu deaths in Grant County in the six months from November through April. Statement has to be vague because the papers would sometimes refer to several deaths with no number given. I was conservative on this point and took several to mean two. Probably it meant more than that, but who knows. Of those approximately 31 deaths, only five, five, were identified as Hispanics, surely an absurd undercount of the actual toll on Chihuahua Hill and in the mines and camps of Grant County. Now there is another source. When I gave this talk last month, Tom Hester called in a question about the death records that we have in the public library. And they are not currently accessible, but Javier Marufo heroically looked through that file for me and painstakingly transcribed the details of 64 deaths from the flu and pneumonia during those six months. 10 of those 64 deaths were soldiers who died of the flu at Fort Baird in October. Thereafter, this is interesting, I don't know what it means, thereafter the county kept no record of deaths at the fort. Deaths at the fort were apparently broken off from the record of deaths in Grant County to just regular citizens. Of 19 others, aside from those 10 at the fort, of 19 others identified in those death records as flu deaths, nine were Hispanic. Nine of 19, you see, a much higher percentage than the five of 31 from the newspapers, and further evidence that the papers ignored many Hispanic victims. Of the 35 identified as pneumonia deaths, four were also listed in the newspapers as flu deaths. Probably many other pneumonia victims actually died of the flu, but it's impossible to say how many. So my rough guess is about 50, but perhaps 60 or 70 or more died from the flu among residents of Grant County. In addition, 83 people died of the flu at the Fort Bayard Hospital during 1918. So the total flu deaths at Fort Bayard and elsewhere in Grant County came to perhaps 133. And that I submit is a fearsome toll 
for a small isolated community like ours. In the wake of the Spanish flu, the New Mexico legislature finally created a state health department. To wind up, comparing the Spanish flu with our COVID-19, I am most struck by the general respect for science and medical authorities in Grant County in 1918 to 19. A well-disciplined response did not become a noisy political controversy. Without protests, citizens took responsibility and wore masks. It helped that the crisis here lasted only six months, of course. The town and county imposed necessary measures and generally enforced them. And yet, 133 deaths, plus all those probable Hispanic casualties that went unlisted and unmourned by the local newspapers, amounted to what is still the worst public health disaster in Grant County history. Thank you. All right, Stephen, uh, you want to stick around? We have some questions. Great. All Bye. right. Got lots of them. Okay, Thanks. I am going to start out with uh, reminding everybody that you can either type your question in the Q&A box, and if you'd like, I'll bring you on live or in the chat box, and I'll try to keep a uh, hold of you, keep following here. Um, so we have from Kathy Romero, who wants to know what was the date of the first report of Tyrone, uh, of Tyrone flu cases. Let me see if she wants to come on here. Kathy, there she is. Hi, Kathy, if you'll unmute yourself. Yes. Um, yeah, I just wanted to get an idea of the timeline of um, that first report that you mentioned of flu cases in Tyrome and was it uh, Santa Rita, but mostly Tyrome I was curious about. It was in October sometime. I don't know that I can give you the exact date. Hold on a no, second. No, no, that's close enough. So you're saying October 1918? Yes, yes. The oh. flu uh, basically hit in 1918. The first wave was the first half of the year and wasn't that bad. And then from, oh, I guess August, September on, it got really bad and killed all those people that I've mentioned and, and got here finally in October, November. It was a terrible situation. And the fact that it was going on at the same time as the World War was going on, in the midst of this great crisis, the war ended November 11th. And all of a sudden, people are out celebrating, banging drums, making noise. I'm sure not necessarily wearing their masks in that situation, but uh, it, they had to adjust and go right back to dealing with the pandemic because it was still very much with us into the spring, as I've mentioned. So that was spring 1919. And yes, and actually, yeah. yes. And, and there were traces of it elsewhere until 1920. So Donald Trump, you may remember him. He always used to say the uh, Spanish flu was 1917. Uh, that is one of the very few things that he got factually wrong. It was actually 1918 to 1920, but especially 1918. That's when it was worst. But yeah. there, there's residue of it well into the new year, 1919. Someone, a, a baby died of the flu here as late as June of 1919. But by then, that was just a fluke. It wasn't typical. So I cut it off um, in April, those six months, November through April. That was the, the time we were really dealing with the flu. That's, that's when the crisis was going on here. And in general, as I said, I think we responded very well a good discipline response, uh, but still there were all these deaths nonetheless. Thank you. Thank you, Kathy. All right, let's see, we have a couple others. Let's see, Gerald Schultz, no. Um, his, Gerald's question, is uh, he wants to know if you checked WNMU for any death records? I haven't. Um, I don't know that they have any, perhaps. That, that's an interesting possibility. I'll look into that. Um, 
as I say, it, w, the New Mexico Teachers College, as it was then called, closed on October 1st and stayed closed until well into the spring. So I don't know that anybody was uh, functioning up there during this. Uh, there were no classes. Of course, there were no online classes. The, the school simply shut down and the students were sent home. Wherever they were from, they, they went home. Uh, and that's before the flu hit. So I, I doubt that they spread the flu by going home just because it hadn't come here yet. It arrived a few weeks later. In general, I think the response here was admirable. Well done. And it could have been much worse. It was bad enough with 133, maybe, or 150, or 200. And I'm not just playing around. I mean, the, the figures are so imprecise and involve so much guesswork. There's no way to know, really. But call it 133 for the sake of argument. And that's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. And these uh, death notices that I read, the 10 people, the, those were appeared in the newspaper. Someone would die of the flu, and then there would be an article about it, a little article. Um, that really brings it home to me. It makes it more human and tangible and graspable to have names and ages and uh, details added about these people. That 11-year-old girl in Santa Rosa, Santa Rita, after it had blown up there in December. Um, a lot of grieving people, and particularly, I, I can't overemphasize this, there are probably dozens and dozens of Hispanic deaths in Grant County that did not get counted, that did not appear in the newspapers, and that people just mourned in private and did what they could and kept going. But uh, there's a real disjunction. Uh, you noticed of those 10 people who I listed as having been, uh, ha having died from the flu, and a, there was an article in the newspaper, and that's how I know about them. Of those 10, there's one Hispanic, Daniel Rodriguez, the 16-year-old grocery clerk. The whole thing was grossly underreported. It's, it's an insult, and it's another sign you see of how things are closing down in these years. Uh, in the late 19th century, things were pretty equal here between Anglos and Hispanics. What you see in the early 20th century as the town matures and becomes more modern and has a larger opinion of itself and its possibilities one aspect of that is to start systematically mistreating the Hispanic residents. They just go together. And that's what the flu emerges into, that situation of where in recent years, things have been getting worse for the Hispanic residents of Silver City. And the flu just confirms that, the way it was not reported by the two newspapers in town. It's a great feeling. Great. Um, let's see, we have a few more people that would like to speak to you. Um, let's see, Mary Barrett, let me bring her on. Mary, are you there? You should be able to unmute now. Unmute now. <laughs> Thank you. I was kind of curious, um, how did they test or know it was influenza versus something else or, or how it was bacterial pneumonia versus influenza pneumonia since you know, they didn't really know about viruses and bacteria, the difference between them back then. Yeah. And I was also curious about the medical treatment. Was, was there anything more than aspirin for fever and fluids or? I don't think there was any treatment that was really effective. Um, they could try to keep people warm with a pneumonia jacket if it came down to pneumonia. I think in many cases, it was hard to tell the final cause of death because the flu would typically weaken people in this second phase, and then it would switch to bacterial pneumonia, and that's what actually killed the person. But I think it's, it was often, it's not that they were hiding the flu as the cause of death, it's that they couldn't tell. And it just seemed like the final cause was pneumonia, so they wrote it up as pneumonia. Now, it may be they wanted to understate the deaths from flu in Grant County, just as a public health matter just to so people wouldn't be so fearful and so panicked. Uh, it may be that also if they called it pneumonia, then people wouldn't get upset about, oh God, another flu death. That perhaps entered into it as well. But in general, I was most struck by how little they could do, how little they knew about such a, a virus. Uh, there was no real treatment. They, they tried to keep people comfortable adjust their temperature up or down as necessary, give liquids, uh, as you would treat just a regular flu case. 
but nothing really helped. Uh, people just wasted away. Wow. Thank, Thank, you. Okay. Thank you, Mary. Um, let's see, here is a question from Debbie Bonney, who wants to know probably what a lot of us do, is how does the Spanish flu compare to the COVID-19 cases in Grant County? Well, so far it was much worse because uh, I don't know what the total deaths now are, are in Grant, Grant County. Does anyone have a feel of that? But certainly, 22. I'm sorry? Last I checked was 22. Yeah, that's not bad. Now, what we don't know at this point is how long it's gonna last. Is the vaccine really going to stop it? Um, the Spanish flu was much more deadly. I mean, a worldwide total of about 50 million deaths. Just imagine that, just imagine that. Uh, it was much worse because they had no way of treating it really. They couldn't do much to stop it, to fix it. So uh, it was often just a death sentence and you know, you know, people would be written off as sure to die. And uh, the, this will sound very familiar. The hospitals were extremely taxed, full. Uh, the Santa Rita Hospital, which was a considerable thing, um, people are dying in the hallways because there were no rooms for them. Um, so it was more deadly, but maybe it was more deadly in 1918 just because there was no way of dealing with it, really. Uh, we now have treatments and the vaccine maybe, maybe will soon make us all safe. It's gonna take months, but um, there was no vaccine uh, in, uh, during the Spanish flu. The, the Mayo brothers came up with something in Minnesota that they thought was a vaccine, but apparently it wasn't very effective because it just doesn't appear in the literature much. Um, they got a, a shipment of it actually here in Grant County, that vaccine from the Mayo brothers and that would have been in late December, I think it was. And then there's no further news about it. <laughs> so if it was used and if it did any good, it didn't make the newspapers. I suspect it really didn't do much. There was no vaccine. Um, people were helpless. We're in better shape now. We are. Things are looking up. Uh, and soon we can get back to normal life. Wouldn't, wouldn't, wouldn't that be great? I could go to the library and do research. <laughs> Great. Um, um, Dennis Lane would like to speak. Okay. Dennis, are you there? He's can, here. Can you hear me? <laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm wondering, um, I read the Silver City Daily Press, and um, they are, as many, many people know, are in... Um, are in a, uh, a lawsuit against the Gila Regional Hospital of Silver City, Grant County. And I'm wondering, um, is there any correlation between the lack of knowledge for the average person in a city here in, in Silver City um, as, as it relates to the lawsuit uh, with uh, the Grant, uh, Grant County Regional Hospital? I was just wondering about your comment on something like Yes, that. I, I can't speak to that issue. I don't know about that lawsuit, what's involved, but I just think people in 1918, 19 had more respect for authority. Uh, it wasn't like everyone can be your own doctor by going on the web and looking up things and then you think you know. Back then, uh, there was a real wall between us average people and doctors, physicians, there was a more of an inclination to pay attention to what they're saying and not to insist that one can interpose one's ignorance against their expertise. And that's very different from today. Nowadays, we have the web and people just think they can look everything up and become an expert on it and start arguing with the professionals. Uh, that's not serving us well during this particular pandemic. We all need to pay attention and respect people who know these things. Dr. Fauci, for example. It's a real difference between now and back then, it seems to me. Does that answer your question, Dennis? Uh, well, from my understanding, the, the biggest problem they're having with this lawsuit is, 
is the paper is suing Grand County Regional Hospital because their lack, the hospital's lack of giving information out. Now we all know that there is uh, uh, your your record, your medical records are are supposedly secure, and it's not the point of the Silver City Press. They're saying the Grant County Hospital is lacking in giving giving knowledge to to the population of Silver City or Grant wow. County in general, and that's wow. where there is a, uh, a a a real problem, and they haven't solved it as yet. Hmm. That does sound like an interesting discussion. Maybe we should mm -hmm. have at another date. I would like to keep okay. kind of keep us focused on topic, though. Right now, we have. So many, a lot of people with questions, and I don't know that we're really prepared to speak on that in in a responsible way. But thank you. Uh, Stephen, here's another uh, question that um, someone an anonymous: Are there any historical records of the pandemic on the Mimbres Valley? I didn't run into any, and I would love to know that because occasionally the newspapers would say in a vague way, there's activity out in the Mimbres, um, people are sick, uh, but nothing substantial. It's not like they ever sent a reporter out there. They were very focused on Silver City and the mining towns around us, uh, Santa Rita, Hurley, Bayard, uh, Tyrone, and that was really the limit of their coverage. I would love to know about that. And it may be, I didn't get to Santa, um, Santa Fe where the state archives are. There may be stuff up there. Although there are articles and even books on the Spanish flu in the Southwest and in New Mexico. And none of those seem to mention um, archival records about the flu up there. Uh, again, they seem to be limited pretty much to newspapers. But you would think there would be something in the Santa Fe archives, the state archives are in Santa Fe and one would think there would be material there and maybe if life returns to normal, I'll go up there and take a look around. I've gotten hooked on the subject. Uh, I think I'm gonna write this talk up as an article, perhaps try to publish it in uh, Desert Exposure. Uh, it's interesting stuff that I think people would be interested to know given our current pandemic and the struggles with that. But um, I, I must say, I've only scratched the surface of research here. It's so long ago, there's nobody to interview about it. It's over a hundred years from uh, ago, but, but there's, there's stuff and there's more stuff in Grant County that I haven't gotten to that I haven't become aware of yet. So stay tuned, more to come. Okay, let's see, we have, Sharon, let me, Get her up here, Sharon Wilkie. Hi, Sharon, did I say your name right? And you can unmute it. Yes, you did. Uh, yes, you did. <laughs> uh, thank you. And thank you so much for this great talk. It's, it's fascinating. And I, I wanted to mention that um, <clears throat> my grandmother was one of the people you mentioned who died uh, during the flu. And my sister is also on the call. Um, we don't live in Silver City now, but we grew up here and our grandmother was Lydia Donahue. You mentioned Lida, they pronounced it Lida. Oh. And lived on a ranch outside of Silver and had seven kids, one of them being my, our mother. Wow. And our mother was one of the only girl out of the seven kids. <clears throat> the wow. youngest son was uh, six months old when our grandmother died. And we heard, we've heard over the years that she died. We do know she died on the day the war ended. Uh, we also uh, have heard that several of the kids got uh, very sick with the flu also, but they all survived. So um, this has been fascinating and we really, really appreciate you doing this. That's Thank you. wonderful. It's, it's wonderful to hear from you. Great. Uh, and Lydia, uh, she was your grandmother. Yes. Mm -hmm. and, and your mother and, and your mother was her daughter, did you say? Yes, yes the only, the yes. only girl. Only girl of the seven kids. And what was her name? Our mother's name was was Katie, Katie. Catherine Elizabeth Donahue Robertson. 
do and we know, grew up as Robertsons. Yes. Uh, do you know what happened to those? All of a sudden, that the, the husband there is left with seven children. Do you know? Did he marry again? Uh, how did he, he? How did he manage? He did not. And but the youngest son, who was six months, was basically given to the neighbors, of uh, the Bloodworths. They were named uh, to raise because uh, it was just too much. Because even yes. the oldest son at that time, um, who's the oldest son, Frank, whose son still lives in Silver City, also named Frank Donahue. Uh, he apparently was the only kid of the family who did not get sick. Uh, oh. And he pretty much helped then raise the, the family. My, my mother was seven years old when her mother died. Wow. Just imagine the, all of that falling on your grandfather. Yes. He's lost his wife and the mother of seven children. And what does he do right. then? Wow. Did, did he stay uh, out on that ranch? Is that where they grew up? They did. As far as I know, they, um, they stayed there for quite a few years afterwards. Uh -huh. But I'm not positive. They may have uh -huh. moved it sometime. I have to ask my, uh, my other relatives about that. Yes. That's wonderful. Uh, would you please uh, send your name and phone number to the museum office? I, I would like to be in touch with you about this, if I might. Be glad to. Great. That would be terrific. I'll do that. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks for calling in. That's wonderful. Sorry about that, Sharon. Um, we were, I was actually uh, wanting to ask if I could get some, some uh, content information from you myself so that we can, uh, as so that the, the museum can talk to you a little bit more. Is that all right? That'd be sure. fine. Certainly. Sure. Oh, yeah. All right. I will put um, my email. And if anybody has any questions around here uh, about anything, you can email me at education at silvercitymuseum.org. And I will either answer your question or get it to somebody who can. Great. And your name is Erin Griffith. My name is Erin Griffith. Thank yes. you. <laughs> OK, thank you, Sharon. It was great talking to you. Thank you. We have Sharon McDonald. Let me bring her on. Hi, Sharon McDonald. Are you there? Can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Yes. Thank you. OK, this is Shari McDonald, Will's member and I want and museum supporter. I wanted to ask if there was any mention of using herbal uh, medications or homeopathy. Both, you know, had been used for era for an era. Well, homeopathy, the uh, 1800s. But anyway, was there any alternative or even Native American medicine or home remedies mentioned in treatments? Thank you, Stephen. Hi, Shari. Uh, thanks for calling in. Yes, the, I found nothing along those lines. But again, I found hardly anything about how Hispanics were responding to this crisis. And uh, folk medicine and alternative medicines have always been a big part of the local Hispanic culture. Uh, and they've been amused to see how so many Anglos in the recent decades have been embracing herbal remedies and alternative yes. medicine. It's, there's an irony there. And so I would yes. guess, this is just a guess, but on Chihuahua Hill and in the mines and camps of Grant County, uh, in Hispanic neighborhoods, uh, they got sick and they probably did not go to regular doctors. They couldn't afford it, regular doctors, regular hospitals. What they went to was the folk remedies they had all grown up believing. And that would be fascinating. I just don't know how to get at it because it would be oral history. None of this, I'm sure, was written down at the time. There would be no written record of it now. And I don't know, maybe people with memories of 100 years ago, I mean, people with ancestors who were here 100 years ago, maybe use those remedies and they passed down the stories. But I haven't heard anything like that. But I can imagine that's the case, because as I said, the Hispanic neighborhoods could not afford doctors and hospitals, were probably suspicious of what the Anglo doctors might do to them, whether they would yes. be treated fairly and respectfully by the Anglo doctors. Given recent trends in Grant County, this trend toward increasing segregation and discrimination against Anglos, that's going on when the pandemic hits. And so I can imagine that most of the treatments in the Hispanic neighborhoods were folk remedies. They weren't Western medicine. 
they were no. alternative medicines. So Sherry, I'm sure it happened, but I got to tell you, I don't have any evidence of that, but it just makes um, sense. Yeah. That is what yes. happened. Yeah. I would start with Dr. Arizaga and ask him, and then perhaps put a ad in the newspaper asking people to come forward of, of the Hispanic mm -hmm. group. And mm -hmm. uh, you don't want to lose any more of them before they do tell you, my grandmother said we did X, Y, Z. And that way you'd have a fuller picture of treatment of Hispanics. And, but Dr. Arizaga, Della Augusta, you know, our various uh, liaison people, would help you, I'm sure, to get to those folks that are back in some corner. They still are suspicious of Anglos and who can blame them the way they've been treated. So I, I wish you luck with this. Uh, yeah, good, good, good suggestion. Dr. Arizaga, excuse me, Dr. Arizaga is a local MD, but he has distinct tendencies toward alternative medicines and folk remedies. So yeah, that's a good idea. I'll look into that. Thank you. Thank you Maria, sir. his wife is a shaman. Yes, please do. Uh -huh. Sharon, um, before you go, I actually, and for everybody, I have a little bit more information on the subject that was gotten while we were talking. For one thing, I wanna let everybody know, um, and Stephen, you might be happy to hear this, that the museum is starting uh, shortly. We're in the, the very, very beginning stages of doing a history project, a research project based solely on Chihuahua Hill that we'll be doing a lot of collecting oral histories and um, we'll, uh, we have support from, from the town to uh, begin working on that. And uh, finally, finally being able to give that uh, area and section of our history the little bit of the respect it deserves. So That's we're great. very happy to be doing that and hopefully we'll have new resources to contribute to all of these conversations. Um, and also on that, I received a message from Neva Konigsberg, I'm not sure if I'm saying her name correctly, uh, who is the owner of Bear Creek Herbs and says that she does know of some herbal remedies that were used to treat the influenza. Um, at the time, allopathic medicine, as we know it did not exist. The American official pharmacopoeia consisted primarily of herbal medicinal treatments. So, there's a little bit more information that we might want to process from Bear Creek Herbs. And um, Gerald Schultz also offered to put out a general call for local information uh, for local people who might have any hand-me-down information on the subject. So, yep, look at this. I love these kinds of conversations that are developing and, and, and going on in these talks and we're able to bring more information to the table and more learning for everybody, just sharing all of this. I love that. All right. So thank you, Sharon, for some for a great question. And I will uh, speak to you soon, I hope. It's great to hear from you. All right. Uh, we have another question from Kathy Romero, who has been very patiently waiting to get in another one. It should be Stephen, do you know if the two girl students, um, Sully's daughter and I'm not sure the other one last name, uh, that uh, went to school in LA, did they survive? I don't know. It was Ruth Sully, mm -hmm. S U L L Y, and Helen Carrier, C A R R I E R. They were good friends and they went out to LA to the Marlboro School. And I know that. Um, Helen graduated actually in the spring of 1919. So I know she survived and I think Ruth did too. Um, probably there's uh, available stuff about that. Uh, when John Sully, he was the guy who created the mining town of Santa Rita and the mining town of Hurley with their open pit mine and the converter mill. Sully was a really big guy and he died in harness in 1933. He just, he ran those two places in every every detail from about 1910 till his death 23 years later. I can look up the obituaries and see who survived him to see if Ruth survived him. I haven't seen anything to the contrary, so I'm guessing they both did. And as I say, Helen graduated that uh, June of 1919 from the Marlboro School, and Helen was a year behind her. Um, I think they both survived, yes, I think so. 
even though they perhaps were the people who brought the virus to Santa Rita, not on purpose, of course, not on purpose. They just wanted to, to get home when their school closed in LA because of a flu outbreak. So they probably thought it was a good idea to get out of LA and take the train to Deming and then to get the car ride up to Santa Rita and be home with their family. Um, it didn't turn out that way, but it, you know, they had the best of intentions. They didn't intend to bring the virus to Santa Rita. But I think that's what happened. On the other hand, as I've said, I'm making a guess here, it may not have happened at all. <laughs> History is like that. Even when you've got a lot of evidence, you cannot ever be absolutely certain of any damn thing in history. There's always a possibility for something else. So it keeps us humble to the extent that we are kept humble. <laughs> all right. Um, thank you. Um, I an anonymous question says that they work with a grad student at Stanford ooh, who is doing work on a rural ethnic study and would like to share this lecture with her. Oh, this is for me. Uh, yes, everybody, we will be, this is being recorded as well as streamed on Facebook Live. Um, after this uh, talk is over, we will edit it. I will post it on our YouTube channel and you will all receive links to it. And uh, so that you can share that. I also encourage you to view all of these, uh, all of our past lectures on our website at www.silvercitymuseum.org. Under programs, there is a link to our YouTube channel that has all of our past lectures. This one will be joining it very shortly and you are very welcome and encouraged to share it both on Facebook and the YouTube to anyone and as many people as you can and let's get all of this fantastic information out there. And, and Stephen Fox, Dr. Stephen Fox, uh, let's get more of his wealth of information inside his brain circulating amongst the general populace. That's one of my missions in life now. All right, all right. Um, okay, let's see. Are there any more questions? Uh, B says that she uh, loves the comments about folk medicine and is uh, excited about hearing about um, the collection of oral history. So thank you, B. Stephen, do you have any closing statements that you'd like to give our audience? No, but I really love the, the question and answer period. That is often my favorite part of the talk. And uh, particularly the woman whose grandmother I mentioned, that's just wonderful. And uh, I hope to pursue that a bit. Uh, that's just a, uh, that makes my day. That's great. Thank you, Erin. Yeah, I thought, well done. Well done. Thank you. I have to admit, it is one of my favorites as well. All right. I'll bring it back home for a little bit. Before I get going, I want to remind everybody that if you would like to donate to the Silver City Museum Society, of which Dr. Stephen Box is a board member, we um, it is a nonprofit uh, support system for our museum. It helps lets us uh, be able to have programs like this free to the community, as well as helping with um, salaries for our very um, important staff that does tons of work and keeps us going. So if you can do that, www.silvercitymuseumsociety.org, which is the homepage of our society. And you can also find more information about joining that um, slash virtual tip jar is where we, are, where we will be collecting those. And with that, thank you very much. Please take the, the uh, survey that will pop up when we end here. And it was great seeing you. See you again soon. Thank you, Stephen. Thank you, Aaron. Went well. Thank you. Thanks very much.